Wow, it's amazing how a scene is brought together. It's a lot of work and it involves many people. And these stacks of drawings represent a short sequence of about a minute and 50 seconds worth of full feature animation in both rough and cleanup. That's a lot of drawings. Now let's sidestep for a moment and talk about something that's part of that process, which every animator needs to know, and that is how to follow timing charts and create proper in-betweens. Many animators actually start their career as an in-betweener or an assistant to an animator doing that very thing. But even so, you have to learn how to in-between your own work because number one, that is part of the animating process, and number two, in most studios, they won't have an assistant for you, in which case, you'll have to do it yourself. It's one thing to learn the posing and creative side of animating, but if you don't know how to finish it with proper in-betweens, then your scene in the end could turn out lousy. To start off with, I first want to explain the two main approaches to animating a scene. The first one is a method called straight ahead, and the second is called pose to pose. In the straight ahead approach, the animator draws the first drawing and literally works very loosely straight ahead from that point on, allowing the animator to be spontaneous, doing one drawing on top of the other, until you come to the end of the scene. And you don't look back or stop to necessarily pre-plan any specific action. Now this approach is meant to be highly improvisational and creative, thinking of new ideas as you go along in both drawing and action. The downside to this approach is that it's very hard to follow up on or tie down the scene after the dust is cleared. And it often creates a lot of technical issues to be resolved later. Most wild actions like scrambling or flurries, for example, are more effective with straight ahead animation. Now pose to pose, on the other hand, is a much more structured method and so much easier for an assistant to follow up on. Here the animator exercises greater control over the movement by planning out each pose carefully. In this approach, the animator comes up with the main storytelling poses from the beginning, making sure that the overall acting points of the scene are hit. And once those are relating and working well together, then subsidiary poses are created to further define each movement within those major poses. On each of those poses, there is a timing chart created so that from that point on, an assistant can take over the scene and by following those timing charts can draw the necessary in-betweens to finish it up. One approach is not necessarily better than the other because each one offers certain advantages. And to quote the illusion of life, with pose to pose, there is clarity and strength. In straight ahead, there is spontaneity. And that pretty much sums it up. Personally, I approach most of my scenes with a certain combination of both together. For example, I might start a scene creating the main poses that show the story points in the scene, and I do that so that I know generally where I'm going. But then I use straight ahead animation to animate between or through them or to get a certain gesture or movement right to create more fluidity or get the creativity I want within those poses. And I might not even use those first poses, or I might modify them a little bit by the time that I'm finished. With that brief explanation of how an animator approaches a scene, we can now better talk about how to follow timing charts and how to create the necessary in-betweens. Let's use this scene, for example, of a character doing a head turn and take. The animator first draws out the main key poses that are necessary for telling the story. In this case, there are three main poses only. The starting position, the glance pose, and the change of expression pose at the end. Those three drawings alone define what has to happen in this scene. After the animator is satisfied with how those work, then he has to figure out how he's going to move from one pose to the other. And he does that by creating breakdown poses which define more specifically the individual movements. And remember in the previous lesson, I explained that you should not just animate from one major pose to the next in a straight line but you have to add properly positioned breakdown poses which creates arcs and a more full movement. And if done correctly, it will make the movement believable and beautiful to watch. Then the animator can tie those drawings down and this is what it looks like with those breakdown poses added in. Next, the animator puts any instructions and timing charts on those poses and hands the scene off to an assistant where the in-betweens can be added in. All right, let's make some in-betweens by taking this first movement, which is the head turn. 
In this movement, there are the two key poses and then one breakdown pose that creates the under arc as he turns to glance back. First, we roll the three drawings to make sure we understand the movement in its entirety, noting any arc lines that we have to follow. Then we look on the first key pose where there is a timing chart stipulating how many in-betweens to make between this and the next pose and where they are to be positioned. See, this is drawing number one and it's circled on the chart because it is the current drawing or the one that has the chart on it. And the chart indicates that we have to create two in-between drawings which are slowing out of pose number one and into pose number seven. And by the way, the numbers on your drawing should also correspond to the frame number in the scene. And so if we're animating on twos, that's why we're counting by twos. One, three, five, seven, and so forth. We create number five first because we can't make number three until five is created, right? And that's because we have to use number five and one in creating number three. Okay, so here we go. To create in between number five, we put poses one and seven on top of each other and turn the light box on to see them both together and get a blank sheet of paper to draw the number five in between on. We need to flip the two poses back and forth to see clearly where those lines should be positioned. This is an exact in between, so we have to make a drawing that is exactly positioned in the middle. You'll notice how I've been flipping today. It's different, isn't it? It's not like the flipping methods that I showed you the last time. This is an in-betweeners way of flipping, and it goes like this. Kind of confusing, huh? <laughs> like I've explained, you put first the two main poses on top of each other, like this, and then you put the paper where you're going to draw the in-between on, on top of those. And that's so you can see clearly the differences between them and you're able to draw comfortably on that top sheet. Now for the flipping part. This can be confusing, so I'm going to give you a rhythm to remember until it becomes second nature to you. First, you bend back the two top sheets exposing the first sheet. Then you bring those back down, which exposes the second sheet. And then using your index finger, you bend back the top sheet alone, and that exposes the third sheet. And then you repeat two top sheets, then one, two, one, a two, a one, a two, a one, and two, and two, and one, and two, and faster, two, one, two, one, two, one. <laughs> Anyways, you get the hang of it. And when you learn to do that very fast, you will see it move just like you would if you were rolling those drawings in order. Now that you know how to do the in-betweeners flip, why don't you sit back for a moment and watch me finish the rest of this in-between. And I'll give you some tips along the way. The key to good in-betweening really is in this flipping technique so that you're able to see the thing move before your very eyes as you draw. And in your mind's eye, you can train yourself to see those invisible arcs and know right where that shape should be placed as you flip. And here is another key point. And that is that as animators, you're not just drawing flat lines. Don't just see lines. You are drawing shapes and moving objects around. So you should be seeing those three-dimensional shapes as you flip, not lines. In other words, you should not just rely on the backlight and just draw all the lines in the middle mindlessly, because they will be flat and disconnected if you do that. And that's why we constantly flip so we can see that movement and fill in that voided space in our mind's eye to create properly what should be there. Now it's important that if you're following up on another animator's scene, you should try the best you can when you're doing your in-betweens to match their drawing style and their line quality. For instance, this scene that I'm working on here, it's pretty tied down. They're almost cleaned up drawings, but that's not always the case. An animator can and usually does work a lot more rough than this. And so as an in-betweener, you would also do those in-betweens in that same rough style so that when it is shot in a pencil test, you wouldn't necessarily know that two or more people worked on it. It should look like the same artist drew every drawing. Again, for emphasis, 
You are not drawing lines, you are moving objects or forms. I made a sculpture of this character years ago and it does help a lot to be able to use for reference and to see his features from all angles. Again, anything to help us visualize the character three-dimensionally is always good. It's common for a studio to hire a sculptor and make maquettes and busts like these of the characters in the show for the animator to be inspired by and to use for reference. A lot of time and effort is also put into making character turnarounds and expression sheets. This helps the animators to draw consistently from scene to scene throughout the movie. And it's a style guide for drawing the characters. I look forward to talking to you more about character design in future lessons. And ta-da, it's all done. Now let's put the drawings in order and roll them to see how they work. Oops, as I check the arc here, I can see that the nose is a little short. No problem, we can go back and make that correction. That's much better. All right, let's do a different set. Again, taking the two main poses and I put a blank sheet on top. Always flipping to see between the poses and remember, you have to follow those arc lines. You're not just moving in a straight line between the two poses but you need to find the arc lines in the movement and your in-between should be on those arc paths whether it's a nose or the eyes or anything. Here I'm trying to figure out the correct placement of his nose and eyes by figuring out the arc paths that it's moving on. Sometimes it's helpful to draw in the shapes of the two noses and then draw the in-between nose like I'm doing here. You can also make points or dot marks, a lot of people do that, and that will help in finding the proper in-between placement for any given part of the object, and then you can erase those construction marks later. You will also notice that when I'm creating an exact in-between, I'm also trying to match the exact in-between expression. For example, in the first pose, the eyes are shut. And in the last pose, the eyes are open. So when we do the in-between, we draw the eyes half open. Or if you're making a creative choice, then you can favor one pose or the other. Again, for emphasis, you are not drawing lines, you are moving objects or forms. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that you need to be careful to keep the volumes of your shapes consistent from one drawing to the next. And that is a key principle while you're in between. And the only way that you can do that is by flipping. You've only heard me mention that about a hundred times, right? Let's do a different set. Notice as he does his big take here as he goes down. I wanted to get a nice wide arc as you can see that this in-between that I'm making is not exact, but the head is tilted differently than how an exact in-between would be placed. Those are creative in-betweens and that call is made by the animator. He or she would either give you instructions or a guide to follow for those, or give you a partial drawing of the heads to follow here. 
Okay, and you can finish the rest of the in-betweens in the same manner. Just follow the timing charts. On this final movement, you can see that there is a nice big overshoot in the expression before settling into the final pose. And I follow the charts as always so that I know how to make those in-betweens for it here. Now when all the in-betweens are finished and added into the scene, this is what it looks like. If we did our job right from the posing to the breakdowns to the in-betweens, it comes to life, doesn't it? It's a living, breathing character and the audience will believe it to be such. That's the coolest thing in the world to me. Whew, that's a lot of work, isn't it? I told you it would be. Are you ready to try it out on your own? If you are, then you can download this scene or other scenes that we have for you to choose from by logging on to www.lesson2assignments.blogspot.com and there you will find specific instructions for this in-between test and the other assignments given in today's lesson.